This morning we are back in our series in the book of Acts. We've been in this series for the whole year. We've called it In Pursuit as we have been pursuing after God, the Holy Spirit, and how He works in and through us and how He expands the church of Jesus Christ. So we'll be back in it for the next few weeks. And so one thing which I picked up as uh, we start this mini-series within this series is that oftentimes when we read the Bible, we focus on the big characters, whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, if I was to say, David, you all know who David is. But if I say Rehoboam, you're like, eh, who's Reho what? We're not too sure. We focus on the big characters, and we don't bother to think that the other characters that God has allowed to come into Scripture are actually useful. They are part of His story and part of His unfolding story of grace. And so when we come to the book of Acts, we tend to focus on two characters— can somebody say who and who? Can you guess? Paul, obvious. The other character? Peter. We tend to focus on those two characters and we ignore everyone else as if Paul and Peter went about preaching the gospel just by themselves. But the truth is that Peter and Paul would not have accomplished anything that they did in ministry without the help and collaboration of other people. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the other characters, people who came alongside Peter and Paul to help them in ministry such that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be known worldwide. I trust that as we go through this mini-series that you too would realize one thing that we've been saying over and over again, that God has gifted you. God wants you to be a part of His body and to function as part of the body. It's not just the pastors and the evangelists and so forth who are called to do God's work. It's all of us. And God has put you in his body so that you can play your part and your role. So as we look at these characters, I trust that you would see that these are ordinary people who've been gifted by God and they utilize their gifts for his glory. Expand your view of how God works. Because at the end of the day, whether you've been saved a day or you've been saved for many years, God wants you to function fully in the body of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to Acts chapter number 16. The scriptures will also go behind me on the screen. We're reading from verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of, of Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I'm going to pick up a few observations as we go through the text. The first one is that you will see that Luke, unlike in other parts of Acts, uses the word we every now and then. So he was part of some of this journey. So as we read, we are reading a first-hand account, of, a first-hand account of somebody who is present. He was not told this happened. He's, he was with them. And so Paul and his buddies wanted to preach the gospel in Asia. But Scripture says the Holy Spirit kept them from going there. But as good Christians, they were not discouraged. They tried to go to Asia Minor, so leaving the big A to go to the small A. And they go to what is modern day Turkey now. And as they try to go in and preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit stops them again. I found this pretty odd because Jesus said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. But when these guys are trying to fulfill Jesus' mandate, somehow the Holy Spirit says, don't go. But it seems that God was preventing them from going into Asia because he had something else in store for them. Perhaps something greater. You see, as human beings, we aren't happy with disappointment, right? Oftentimes when a door closes, what is our response besides disappointment? We open our ears and we want to hear what others are saying to us. And most of the time, this is what they'll say, or a variation of this. God doesn't close one door 
without getting ready to open another door with bigger and greater things, right? You've just been dumped by somebody who you thought you were in love with, and they're like, don't worry, God will give you something better. You're fired from your job, don't worry, God will give you a better job with better pay. We always say that to our friends to console them, right? And I'm sure as God the Holy Spirit stops these men from going to Asia, some of them were thinking, God must be leading us to something greater and better. There's a bigger territory that we can preach the gospel in. There's more we can do for God because he has said no. Lo and behold, Paul gets a vision at night. A man from Macedonia is calling out saying, come over here, Paul, come over here. Could this be that big break that they were looking for, that God finally is going to open a wide and an open door? I love what verse 7 says. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. In other words, these guys were excited. Yes, this is that door. Concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. That is the people in Macedonia. Let's continue in our text from verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the day we went on to Neapolis, from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Tyra named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Uh, wait a minute. Didn't Paul get a vision of a man calling them? from Macedonia saying, come and help us. Isn't this supposed to be the big break that God is giving them? But watch. The first people they come across are a, a bunch of women, not in a synagogue, not in a temple, by the riverside. But God, I thought you were opening a big door for us. What's happening now? We've said it over and over again, that at this time, women were not important. Women were treated as things that you sent and owned as property. So if God is calling you for the big opportunity, why would be the first people you see be women? I can only imagine how some of these guys felt. God, you didn't want us to go to Asia. You didn't want us to go to little Asia. And you gave us a vision, but somehow we get here and it's just a bunch of women by the riverside. Child of God, we all need to understand something. It's a hard lesson, a lesson that the older I get, I still haven't really wrapped myself around. And that is at times God will do some things that don't make sense. Amen? God will do some things that don't make sense. But this is what you need to know. Here's the truth, that even though they don't make sense to you, God is busy. God is busy working it all out for his glory. And what you need to do is to trust that whatever's happening, however God is leading me, however he's directing me, it will all end up being for his glory. So let's make sense of the scene. They get to Philippi and they go to the riverside. So why the riverside? You see, at that time you needed at least 10 Jewish men in order to start a synagogue or a house of prayer. If you read throughout the book of Acts, you would know that Paul always first went to the synagogue to preach to the Jews, and when they rejected him, then he went out to the Gentiles. So Philippi wasn't evangelized even by Jews, so there was no temple. There were no 10 Jewish men to start a synagogue. So what those who believed in Judaism or so-called God-fearers, people who had assented to the God of Israel, they would go and meet by the riverside. And as the text tells us, it was mostly women. And they would meet there by the riverside because the river allowed or permitted them to be able to do that cleansing ritual because that's what the temple required. And so they would meet by the riverside to cleanse themselves as they went to pray to Yahweh. 
Those of you who drive here from four ways or from, Lone, or from Lone Hill would drive past Main Road, right? And every Sunday, what do you see on the, on the side of the river? Cars are parked alongside. Because for years, for thousands of years, people have used water as a medium for talking to God or cleansing. So as we drive to church every morning, my kids ask me, what's going on? What are these people here to do? They're here to worship. And so these women were there to worship. Paul and Silas don't respond in a weak way. Though the vision was of a man from Macedonia calling out to them, these guys begin to preach the gospel to those who are present. And as they preach the gospel, one of the women stands out. Her name was Lydia from Tytera, which was in Asia. For those of you who are deep thinkers, think about it. She was from Asia, but I'll just move on. Though women were insignificant at this time, Luke takes time to write about them, and he takes time to give Lydia a name. This spoke volumes to the people at that time, to the first century Christians, that in Jesus, you matter. Though you are a woman, in Jesus, you matter. Jesus has embraced all of us. So he tells us that there was a woman by the name of Lydia. And as we go on, we will see that because of what Jesus has done, women are counted or women are included in the gospel story. Friends, this seemingly insignificant encounter by the riverbanks of Philippi changes the trajectory of the church forever. And as I read the passage, I began to think of our own country, South Africa. Growing up, I would know my grandmother on every Thursday would put on her church uniform and go to church to pray. While many men stayed home, drinking, getting up to no good, grandmothers, women would get up and go and pray to the God who lives and say, God, would you change this nation? God, would you do something in my grandkids' lives? There's a lot that we owe to women in this nation and throughout this continent. There's a lot that we owe to women in this world. Amen, somebody. Because they dared to believe that there's a God in heaven who can do something different. And here we are about to encounter one such woman. So who is this Lydia? As we said, Lydia was from Thyatira, which was in Asia. And Thyatira was known for its purple cloth market. At that time, purple cloth was made from a, a special dye. And it was the kind of material, after it's been dyed purple, that only the rich and the nobles would be able to afford. In fact, it took a Roman centurion uh, to save up for six months to be able to afford a piece of purple cloth. And I know that doesn't make, make much sense, but then in today's world, we could say an engagement ring worth 20,000 rand. That's what they are, an equivalent there. So cloth that would cost around 20,000 rand. So we're talking about Louis Vuitton, Burberry, <laughs> David Klein, or Marcos. You understand? You don't just walk in there. I know some of you are smiling because there's a store just down the road in Maclosa there at the mall. And when you get there, you just, I, I don't go in here. Because they look at you and your shabbiness, they're like, ah, wah, wah, wah. our jersey won't fit you. So Lydia was somebody who owned a boutique store. And so the people of Titera would move around all over the Roman kingdom selling this purple cloth. And so she probably moved from Thyatira to Philippi in order to continue this business of hers. That is the only thing we know about Lydia. That she was dealing purple cloth. Nothing else. However, I believe that the little that we do know of her is enough to spur us in our faith. 
I mean, why else would God derail the plans of an evangelistic team in order to go meet this little nobody by the side of the river? Unless the Holy Spirit has something in store for us as well. And so we know that Lydia was wealthy because purple cloth was in high demand. Therefore, those who dealt in it tended to have a lot of money. Evidence of her wealth is seen that when, they were, when she was saved and her family was baptized, what does she do? She invites them to come to her home. And Luke says she had a household. I don't know about you, but I don't think she was inviting them to a two-room house. It says that she had a, a household. And then she says, oh, if I am really your sister in Christ, come and stay over at my house. And the words that he uses there is that she persuaded us. So she was rich and she had a big house. And I know what some of us are like. We're like, ah, yes, amen. She was rich in a big house. Is that what we're to learn from Lydia? All of us should be rich and have big houses. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Can I give you three observation points and then I'll be out of your way? First observation that we pick up from the life of Lydia is this, that Lydia loved God. Verse 14 One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So even even before Paul and his compadres showed up, Lydia was already following the, the ways of Yahweh. When the message about Jesus was preached, her heart was open and she became a believer. Listen to the descriptive that Paul, that rather that Luke uses of her. She was a worshiper of God. How would you feel if people described you as a worshiper of God? Not by a great accountant, not by a good pastor, a good this and that, but a worshiper of God. That when you died on your tombstone, people would say, there lies to me a worshiper of God. What a testimony. I wonder what it must have been like for Lydia and the ladies to be on the side of the river worshiping God in a culture that did not approve of Yahweh. They must have been ridiculed and ostracized you crazy woman. Why don't you come and worship with us at the temple? Why don't you slaughter? Why don't you do this? They're like, no, 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 no. We worship a different God. We worship the creator of heaven and earth. I really believe that these women worship God so much that God says, to these guys who had their own plans about preaching the gospel in Asia, that guys, ah, 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 hold on. There's some daughters of mine who love me so much that you need to disrupt your plans and go there. The way they love me, the reward they'll receive is you going to an insignificant place to preach my word so that they might have eternal life. Because when Paul and his friends arrive, unlike in other places and acts, there's no opposition to the preaching of the gospel. Luke says, and the Holy Spirit opened their hearts. They were ready. Can you imagine you believe one thing today? Somebody comes and says, what you believe is not the full story. Most of us would be like, come on, get out of here, man. We've believed this for years. But not with these ladies. Immediately, the hearts were opened, and they were baptized. We serve a God who changes people's circumstances. We have a God who's able to see us, even when we're far from Him. This is what's happening here. And so, you might have a friend, a relative, who is far from God, I would exhort you, keep on praying for them. Maybe God might do something similar like he did for Lydia and these ladies. That he'll interrupt somebody else so that they can hear the gospel. 
We must be people who ask God and say, God, can you interrupt my life so that I can share the gospel with somebody else, so that they can see you. Lydia loved God. In verse 15 of Acts 16, it says, after she and her husband were baptized, she urged us, if you, consider, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So Lydia was not just about, I'm saved and that's good. She said, no, no, no. Everybody around me has to meet this Jesus. She was so convinced of Jesus that her whole household was baptized. She loved God so deeply that after being saved, she challenges these guys. She says, guys, you've preached the gospel. I've received the gospel. Come to my house. If you say you and I are now the same, nothing should inhibit you from coming to my house. She was so resolute in her faith that she was completely captured, enamored by Jesus. Jesus, what can I do for you now? She was literally saying to them, you guys have given, me, have given me the best news. The best news ever. So please come and stay in my house. That will be a token of my appreciation to God and you. And that takes us to our second observation. Lydia not only loved God, but she utilized her gifts. Though a relatively young believer, believer Lydia immediately began contributing to God's family by her gifts, immediately. She had the gift of hospitality. We see it. She says, guys, come and stay at my house. Those words. She persuaded us. Maybe the guys in the beginning were like, nah, nah, it's okay. We don't want to stay with you. It's okay, you know. She says, come on, guys. Come on, guys. My home is open. Come. There's much that I can do for you. She knew she instinctively knew that she had a role in God's kingdom. If you guys are going around preaching the gospel to people all over, you probably need lodging, right? You probably need food, right? I've got that. I'm gifted. Come. She's a gracious host. But not only that, she's generous. About 10 to 15 years later, from Acts 16, Paul writes a letter to this church in Philippi. So in Philippians 4 and 15, this is what he says. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, this is about giving money, except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts my need several times. Now, we cannot know with certainty whether Lydia was in Philippi at the time that Paul writes from Thessalonica, 10 or 15 years later. But what we do know is this. The church started in her home. What we do know is that when Paul first left Philippi, Lydia funded the gospel mission. So she's not only a gracious host, she's also a generous giver. She willingly gave so the gospel could reach the believers in Thessalonica. So we could say that the church in Thessaloniki owed the believers in Philippi a debt because they would not have known Jesus but for their paying the way. Paul says in Philippians, time and time and time and again, you sent me enough for my provision. So the Philippians didn't just send a one-time gift. They kept on giving and giving and giving and giving to show continuous generosity. This blew my mind. Somebody comes to faith and immediately they're like, sure, God, what can I do for you? God, how can I give of everything? Sometimes we think that we need to be a couple of years saved. Let me be super spiritual before I can do anything in the church. But not Lydia. Or at other times, we want an invitation so we can serve. But the Philippians looked around and said, ah, the church is not doing that right. Those tables are skewed. I have the gift of administration. Let me sort this out. 
this is not working right. Let me do that. Over the last few months as a church, we've been talking about spiritual gifts, right? And then we even gave you a test to see what your spiritual gift is. Not to see whether you have one, everyone has one, but to see what it is. I hope all of you completed that, and now that you know what your spiritual gift is, you're looking around. Not for me to say, please do this. No, no. You're looking around, and you can say, Pastor Esh, that's not quite right. Or Pastor, I've noticed that the person who does the slides doesn't really keep up. Can I do that? I'm joking. Huizi knows very well. But anyway. Can I use my gift to further the kingdom? Can I use my gift to show that I'm part of the body? This is what Lydia does. So the question to you would be, are you using your gift to benefit others? So Lydia, who meets Jesus on the banks of the river, uses her gift so that others would encounter the same Jesus that she met. That's how much her life was changed. Not only does she use a gift, but Lydia was bold. She was bold in standing for Jesus. As I read these passages in the book of Acts, I often think of the kind of people that Luke is writing about. Some are crazy, but Lydia is bold. How do I know this? Number one, she's a female entrepreneur. Even today, female entrepreneurs will tell you it's hard to get in the game. You need to be bold just to wrestle with the men out there. So she's bold in that sense. But then she goes ahead and invites a bunch of guys that she doesn't know to come to her house. That's crazy. Oh, it's bold. But she says, guys, come to my house. As I said earlier, because there weren't many believers in Philippi, for her to invite guys who are preaching a different gospel would have made things worse for her. I can just imagine the WhatsApp on the street. Oh, there goes the crazy lady. The lady who believes in one God. All of a sudden now she started a cult. All of a sudden she's got funny men at her home. But that does not deter her. She is bold. Later on in Acts 16, Paul and Silas get into trouble. They get publicly beaten and arrested for being troublemakers in Philippi. And after they're released from prison, where do they go? To Lydia's home. I know what I would have been like. Guys, before no one knew you, it was fine, but now everybody knows you. You're troublemakers. Can you please go? You're going to disrupt my business. But Luke tells us that she welcomes them in. And the church is meeting at her house. Paul and Silas get to encourage the believers there. And then they send them on their way. They didn't kick them out. They send them on their way. I'm sure they looked after their wounds. They tended to them. And then they gave them some money to go. To go well. At great risk to her business and to her lifestyle, Lydia welcomes these guys back. You see, too often we buckle under the pressure of unbelievers. When a colleague of yours asks you a sensitive question at work, and instead of answering the right way, what do we do? Ish, let me be cute. Let me give a PC answer because I don't want people to think badly of me. But let me not talk about you, let me talk about myself. I've been to places, and no one knows who I am. We're having a good time, everything's cool. And somehow the conversation gets to talking about pastors and how churches prey on people. And this pastor did this, and this pastor did that, and hey, humanad. people are talking, bad in the church. And then all of a sudden people say, and what do you do? Hey, Jess. In that moment, I just feel like, God, please, just swallow me up right now. But child of God, we need to respond in the way that Lydia responded. Not in fear, but in boldness. Being bold for Jesus. Because for her, Jesus had changed her life. 
He had changed her life in such a way that there was nothing out there that was better. If our lives have been so transformed by Jesus, we shouldn't be afraid of what our colleagues are going to say. We shouldn't be afraid of what our family members will say. I know what some of you are thinking, ah, but self-preservation, I want to get promoted. Really? So you would deny Jesus just for promotion? You deny Jesus for a few thousand rand? The interest rates are going to go up. It's going to blow away anyway. We need to be people who are known for our boldness. Because Jesus has made a difference in our lives worth fighting for. And so as we look at this woman of great faith, we should understand that God uses all people, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or status. We should be people who are unashamed lovers of God. I absolutely love how she's described, a worshiper of God. After coming to faith, Lydia was quick to realize that she has a role to play in God's kingdom. She has a role, and she jumps straight into it. You see, her actions not only benefited Paul and his friends, what she did benefits the whole entire church. Because that church helped fund the gospel going to Asia and other parts of the world. And almost 2,000 years later, we stand on that, on the shoulders of Lydia and the church in Philippi because of what they dared to do. Her life is a model of resolute faith. And I hope that as we have looked at her, as short as the verses that speak about her are, that you be challenged this morning. That yes, you little nobody in Midrand can be used of God. That yes, you who does not have other gifts, just the gifts that God gave you, can make a difference with that which he gave you. Let's not just say we love Jesus. Let's be known that we love Jesus. So the world will know that Jesus is real.